morning. Uh, are we ready? So here's part two of our uh, new series called The Promises of God. And this is probably going to be a shorter series than I normally would. Uh, I have been teaching recently. Anyway, um, it's not, <coughs> this, this series is not so much talking about <coughs> the promises of God Himself, even though we are. But in my heart is that we need to walk in the promises of God. We need to, to, to believe and to embrace the promises of God. We started off last week uh, talking from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And it says, uh, for all, and all means all. all, the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now next week... I'm going to be spending some more time talking about in Him, who we are in Christ. And that is a continuous message we teach in this church about who we are in Christ. But the scripture says that all of the promises, and again all means all, all of the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him are amen. The word amen means so be it. So, God has said that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Him. And it says, to the glory of God through us. God is glorified when we are operating or we are walking in the promises of God. And the promises of God are yes and amen to the glory of God through us. And we have a responsibility with that to experience and to appropriate and walk in the promises of God. So in other words, we also talked last week on this note that God is not just a yes or no God. But God, when he sent Jesus, he said yes. When God said, sent Jesus, he said amen to the promises of God. We talked last week how it's in the, the promise was made to Abraham and his seed, meaning Christ. We talked about how if we are Christ and we are of Abraham's seed and we are heirs of, to the promise. So the promise was made to Christ. And when Jesus came, he said amen and yes to those promises that they might be fulfilled in us. I wish I, I can't, I, you'll have to re, uh, listen to last week's message to get the full uh, thought on that. In other words, Jesus said yes to salvation. Jesus said yes to our redemption. He said yes and he said amen, so be it. Our salvation. Our healing, our provision, our deliverance, our wholeness, our redemption is absolute. It, yes, it's amen. It's a done deal. God said, so be it. Just like a judge, when he uh, puts down the gavel, says, so ordered. God said, yes, he said amen to all of the promises of God in Christ Jesus. And if we are Christ, then we are heirs according to that promise. See, God does not have favorites. We looked a little bit last week about Isaac and, and Ishmael. We looked at a little bit in Jacob and Esau. We didn't go into much detail. But God doesn't have favorites. He, is a, he's not, he doesn't have favorites. He honors faith. He honors faith. The scripture says, without faith it's impossible to please God. Because those who come to him must believe that he is, and that he is a reward of those who diligently seek him. This week we're going to take a look at Psalm 23. And we're going to read through the psalm and we're going to see some promises of God and how they um, uh, minister to us. I just want to make a little footnote here, and I'm not going to go into any detail with any of this, but Psalms 22, Psalms 23, and Psalms 24 are all messianic psalms. David, who was, we know him as a, as, as a king, as a psalmist, as a worshiper, as a shepherd, as a warrior, he was also a prophet. And in these three psalms, he prophesies about the Messiah. Psalm 22 deals with Jesus as our Savior. Psalm 23, which we'll look at today, is Jesus as our Lord. And Psalm 24 talks about Jesus as our coming King. One talks about the presence, uh, about what he did do 2,000 years ago. And he is our Lord today. And he is our coming King. 
and that's uh, and so that's an awesome teach uh, study if you were to go through these messianic psalms. So today we're going to look at Psalm 23. We're going to start with verse one. And I know a lot of us know know uh, the psalm. So we're going to spend some time and probably even a shorter message today to talk about uh, the promises of God. The psalm starts out says, "The Lord is is personal, my shepherd." I shall not want, or I shall not be in want. God is our shepherd. We're gonna we're gonna uh, look at seven points this morning of what that shepherd represents. But again, we're talking about the promises of God, and all of the promises of God, including the seven that we're gonna look at this morning, are yes and amen in in Christ. To us, to the word of God to us. Okay? You make it sense so far? And now I'm just barely getting started. But the Lord is my shepherd. I believe you can make that personal yourself. God is your shepherd. And you shall not be want. So the first thing we're going to look at in a shepherd, we're going to look at the seven things this morning. The first one is that He is your provider. He's your provider. If you shall not be in want, then that means it's a shepherd's problem. It's a shepherd's duty to provide for the sheep. The sheep don't provide for themselves. The shepherd is the sheep's provider. Amen? So, see, again, I, I'm going to be repetitive here. God is not a respecter of people. He doesn't play favorites. God is a respecter of faith. God will always honor faith. When you read the gospel letters, Jesus would heal. Jesus would minister according to their faith. Okay? We talked last week. It's about his grace and faith. We put faith in his grace. We're not the source. And we're not going to put our faith in our faith. So many people get in trouble with that. They, they, they put their faith in their faith ability. That's not faith. That is actually unbelief. We are putting our faith in our shepherd. We're putting our faith in his promises. We're putting our faith in his word. We're putting our faith in his gospel. And our shepherd is our provider. We're not putting our faith in our faith to have provision. We're putting our faith in our shepherd to provide a provision. He is our shepherd. We shall not be in want. Amen? So that means if we find ourselves in a situation where we are in want, we have a shepherd. And God has already decreed that all the promises of God are already yes and amen to us. Amen? Okay? See, it says in Psalm 37, verse 10, the young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. We don't have to lack anything. Why? Because he is our shepherd. But we need to seek the Lord. Jesus said it this way, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. Some of the things I'm sharing this morning are going to be very basic. But how many times, how, how many times have we get so busy with life that we have forgotten the very basic principles of scripture? We get so theological. We get so deep in our, our Bible studies and different things in awesome ways. But he is our shepherd. And we seek the Lord and he is our Lord. See, I love that. The Lord is my shepherd. He's my Lord. He's the one that is in control. Not, and he, he's my shepherd and I submit to his lordship. I submit to his shepherding of my life. And because he's my Lord, he's my shepherd, I won't be in want. Why? Because it's my Lord's problem. Okay? Hopefully I'm making sense. And I'm, I'm very basic this morning. It says in Psalm 37, verses 4 and 5, it says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of thy heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. But Sherry and I, this is a very powerful verse. This is the verse where this whole ministry, this whole journey started. 
Some of you know our story, but a few years back, between 2009 and 2013, we had lost everything. We lost our home, we lost our cars, we lost our jobs. In the midst of it all, we lost our purpose. And then, even other small things like uh, um, um, go into with all that. But in that se season of loss, we also came, we introduced to Andrew Womack, Joseph Prince, and some other uh, ministers that we uh, uh, cherish today. And during that time, we heard about Karis Bible College. We wanted to go to Colorado. We couldn't even uh, uh, put two coins together uh, or anything of that nature. But we couldn't go. We could, we could, there's no way we could have gone to Colorado in the natural. But finally, Karis did come to Ontario, California for a short season. And it was in October ish of uh, uh, 2013 and they were having an open house event and we went there and the, uh, the, the director Ryan May was uh, was teaching and as he taught at this open house event he taught from Psalm 37 verses 4 and 5 and the way we heard it that morning he says you light yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart now there's two ways of looking at that one of them is that he will fulfill the desires of your heart the other way is that he's the one that put the desires there to begin with. We had a desire to go to Bible college. We had a desire to get back into ministry. We had some other desires that were conceived at that point and, and have been conceived. And what we started to do, we started recognizing the desires of our heart were not just our flesh or just something that we were lusting for. But these were desires that God had given us. Satan didn't want us to go to Bible college. Satan didn't want us to go to ministry. Satan didn't want us to fulfill our destiny. And yes, although parts of our flesh wanted to, we just realized that this was God. This wasn't just something that we were just trying to do on our own. And yet at the same point in time, in the season, we had no money. We had no jobs. We now had no income. Sherry had just started working again. And, but the money that she was starting to earn, we were going to put this towards getting the car and, uh, up and running and getting phones and, 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 and some of our basic needs. But God gave us a desire to go to Bible college. And the very next verse says that we heard as Brian was teaching this on that, that Saturday uh, afternoon in October 2013. He says, commit your way to him with that desire. Trust in him with that desire, and he, not you, will bring that desire to pass. And in my thinking, in our thinking, when it says, commit your way to him with that desire, we have a desire to go to Bible college. The proposition was made, register, sign up for Bible college. That was a desire. And our way, my way of committing my way to him with that desire was for us to sign up for Bible college. Not just as part-time students, but full-time students. And not just one registration, but two registrations at full-time. With no money. We had a little bit of money to register, but that's about all we had. And then once as we were putting out all of our hard-earned money that we had just barely, the first paychecks that we were just getting from these jobs Sherry just got, and we put it towards the, the registering for Bible College. Within that... And it, the, the rest of the verse goes, commit your way to him, trusting him that he will bring it past. I'm not going to go into a whole long story, but within an hour of us signing up for Bible college, for the first time in five years, I got a job. That's a whole beautiful story, but I got a job at a toy store. I dropped Sherry off at her job with a car that we had borrowed. And um, God told me to go to the toy store, and I didn't get my second foot in the door, and I heard my name. Long story, I got a job. First time I got a job, first time I even had an interview in five years. And uh, fast forwarding three years, we, we went to Bible college. We were never late on tuition. We graduated sec not only second year of the required classes, but we also went to extension third year. And we graduated. And uh, through that season, we started this church and started after this ministry. And now, just even from a financial standpoint, we are doing better than we've ever done in the, in the financial category. 
where he says, delight yourself in the Lord and he shall give you desires of your heart. Commit your way to him, trust him, and he will bring it to pass. There's still desires that we have. Everything we've done to this point is just really uh, the springboard to what we want to do. In the last couple of years, we've had some challenging seasons. We've had some challenging things. And in the natural, it's like, how are we going to get past some of this stuff? How, you know, in some ways, it's, it's been destructive. Not so much the ministry and not so much other things, doing, but some other things that have been going on that have been hurting us emotionally and whatnot. But this verse still rings. If you like yourself in the Lord, and He will give you desires of your heart. And those desires that God, we have, we know they're from God. And as we commit our way to Him, trusting Him as our Lord and our Shepherd, He will bring it to pass. That might mean we take some steps of faith. Not trusting us, not trusting our performance. But trust in His grace. Does that make any sense? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Part of my desire is, and I'm just going to be frank with you, I want a big church. I want a big ministry. Not because I want to be famous, and not because we want to have some big dynasty, but I want to have a big ministry, something that God has put in my heart. I've had dreams since I was in high school, almost every week, of having a big ministry. And I don't want a big ministry just so we have a big name. But I want a big ministry church because I want to reach as many people as possible with this gospel. There is things that God has revealed in me. There's gifts that God has given me. There's a desire that God has conceived in my heart. And I want to reach as many people as possible with this message. And I know that's one of the reasons we've been going through so many challenging times because the enemy wants to thwart that. He wants to kill that desire and that destiny. But God wants to bring the path, and He is my shepherd, and in, even along the journey, I shall not be in want. Because He is my shepherd. There's multiple promises I'm talking about. I'm talking about Him being our shepherd, our, my provider. But I'm also talking about the promises He's made to me personally. A, a destiny, a purpose, desire that He's put in my heart as a promise. And He says He will bring it to pass. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't know what your desires are. I don't know what your dreams are. Maybe it's for healing. Maybe it's healing for a loved one. Maybe it's provision. Maybe it's reconciliation in a relationship or a marriage or whatever that may be. The Lord is your shepherd. Delight yourself in Him and He will give you desires of your heart. Commit your way to Him. Trust in Him and He will Bring it to pass. Amen? Amen. Psalm 112, verse 1 to 3 says, Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on the earth, and the generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in, the, in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Amen? Amen? See, when I heard the gospel, and I thought I knew the gospel growing up, and not that I wasn't, I don't believe I was taught something that was anti-gospel, per se. But I, I, in my own thinking, in my own reasoning, I don't, I don't believe I had a full revelation of the gospel. I knew that God could heal. I knew that God could provide. I knew that God... Uh, could do all these things. But I never equated that as being part of the gospel. I just equated being part of Christianity, part of who God is, and part of His nature. But when I understood the gospel, I understood that I do not have to put up with sickness any more than I have to put up with any sin or addiction. When I understood the gospel, I understood the promise of God that I can not only be healed, but I can walk in divine health. That is my right. That is my inheritance. And, the, and all the promises of God are yes and amen to Christ. God said amen to my healing through the finished work of the cross. And it's part of my inheritance through the gospel. So when I heard the gospel, I understood I don't have to be sick. I 
status that I don't have to be poor or lack. If there's a destiny that God has for me, and the only roadblock I have to fulfill that destiny is the lack. My God is my shepherd, and I shall not be in one. If I commit to him, trust him, he will bring to the path. We didn't know how we were going to get to Bible college. We didn't even know how we were going to get our lives back together. See, when we, when we lost everything back in 2009, we had three full-time jobs. I had two full-time jobs. Sherry had one. And within overnight... We lost all three full-time jobs and went down to one part-time job. Everything goes in the red real fast financially when you, don't, when you have three sources of income and all of a sudden you have a half income. Just do the math. The bills are still coming in. And they don't have mercy. And so uh, we struggled. And, and it was at the time of the recession. And the recession didn't cause the problem. But once we started circling the drain financially, it was hard to get out of it. That makes sense? And so, but, and so if lack or finances or something, some type of provision is keeping you from going forward, the Lord is your shepherd and you shall not be in what? You, you, I believe in Christ you have everything you need to do what God has called you to do. Some of those things we have to speak for. Some of those things we have to take. Some of those things we need to commit our way to Him, trust in Him, and He will bring it to pass. We need to take a, take, take a step of faith. We took a step of faith to go to Bible college, and God has met our needs. We took a step of faith of starting this church, and that's a whole other story, too. Uh, two weeks from now, we're going to be celebrating four years of having this church. And so, uh, and that was a whole long story, but I didn't plan on starting the church. We just opened our home for Thanksgiving. Our director of the Bible college saw our home, and we could start a church here. He asked if he could, and, and so we gave permission within a few weeks, and I, it seemed like, I don't know what the timeline on that, but he finally just said, you know what, you can be the pastor. I said, well, wow, okay, I wasn't expecting that one. But we've been... You know, everything we've done has been because we committed our way to him, trusting him, he'll bring the past. It's not boasting what we've done. We just, he gave us the desire, he gave us the promise, and we just trusted him. I, when I heard the gospel, I understood I do not have to have lack. And we, we for Sherry and I, our biggest sense of lack is not so much not being able to pay the bills or put food on the table. We've been able to get by and we're pretty content in that area. Not that I wouldn't uh, like some some steak more often at times, but uh, we actually do pretty good now with some of that. I don't even know where I'm going with that. But our biggest desire is wanting to be able to bless people and meet other needs and be able to, to, to do things for the kingdom of God. And so, so many times in the year, especially when we lost everything, that was our biggest pain. It was that we couldn't bless people. And we couldn't do things as we wanted to do. But now we can. And it, it's just that because we understood the gospel, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in one. That means I also, the, the Lord is my shepherd, the Lord is in me, I can also, God can use me to, to meet one another's needs. I don't have to say, sorry I can't help you because I don't have the funds. The heart is there but there's no provision. No, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want or in need. When I heard the gospel, I understood I don't have to be defeated. You know, we were praying about something this morning, and there's something that the enemy has stolen from us. In the last couple of years, there's something God has been stealing from us. Not, I mean, not God, excuse me. The enemy has been stealing from us left and right. And there was just something that rose up in me this morning saying, You know what? I'm sorry, but I want it back. I want back what God has stolen from me. And the scripture says, if the enemy be found, we get sevenfold back. You said it again, God stole. And I want what, God, what the enemy has stolen, I want it back. And I'm not just talking. I demand what the enemy has stolen, they give it back to me. I'm a silver brother. I want it back. And it's going to be better than it ever was before. In other words, when I understood the gospel, I said, all I have to do is believe God. 
All the promises of God are yes and amen in Him through us. But I need to believe God. I need to trust Him. I need to commit my way to Him. Trust in Him that He, not me, will bring it to pass. Does that make sense? Okay? Psalm, one, Psalm 138 verse 2 says, I will worship towards your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth for you have magnified your word above your name. I love that scripture. God will honor his word above his own name. We're going to be talking about his name in just a minute. But God will honor his word above his name. And all the promises of God are yes and amen and him through us. Or to, to the glory of God through and we can trust God that God will honor. He will magnify His Word. And God says He is our provider. He is our healer. He is our soon coming King. We can worship our God. Amen? God will honor His Word. And He will honor His Word in our lives. God will honor His Word in your life. God says you, by His stripes you were healed. God will honor His Word. God says he is your shepherd. You shall not be in one. God will honor his word. And all the promises of God and yes and amen can hear through us. Amen? Okay. So, uh, Psalm, let's go back to Psalm 23, verse 2. It says, And he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He causes me to rest in these green pastures. Green pastures provision. And he leads me beside the still waters. Some of us feel like we've been in stormy waters. It's been a storm. It's been a hurricane. It's been a tsunami. But he makes me to lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside the still waters. The second point I want to talk about this morning is peace. God has promised peace. Amen? God has promised peace. I mean, over... 365 times, God has told us, do not fear. God has promised peace. Psalm 119, verse 165 says, Great peace have those who love your law, or love your word, and nothing causes them to stumble. Jesus said to the disciples in John 14, 27, says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. God has promised us peace. It says in Isaiah that he was chastised for our peace. Okay? Isaiah 26, verse 3 says, You will keep in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. God is your peace. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care how stormy the waves have been and the storm. Get your eyes off the storm and get your eyes on Him. Trust Him because He is your peace. You know it says in Isaiah chapter 52 verse 7 it says, How beautiful are the mountains of the feet of Him who, proclaim, who brings good news, who proclaims peace and proclaims salvation and declares that our God reigns. When we get called and people come to us and we minister to people, one of the first things I do is I proclaim peace. Whether it be in that hospital room or that marriage conflict or whatever the case may be, the first thing we do is proclaim peace. It's hard to minister salvation. It's hard to minister healing. It's hard to minister anything when everyone's emotions are uh, tense. You understand? Does that make sense? And so, but in the second, I don't just, I don't just want peace. Although peace is, is, is the, is the, the atmosphere I want to uh, uh, create. But then I want to proclaim salvation. I want to proclaim, proclaim healing, wholeness, deliverance, prosperity, in whatever situation we're talking about. And because I'm going to declare the circumstances are not going to reign. God reigns in this place. God reigns in this house. God reigns in this situation. I proclaim peace and salvation, and I declare that my God reigns. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're being challenged with, your God reigns. Amen? So going back to Psalm 23, verse 3, we're going to spend a little more time with this, with this verse here. Uh, but it said, I love this part. And it says, verse 3 says, He restores my soul. 
How many of you need some restoration in your soul? How many of your soul gets, gets uh, whether that be anger, depression, discouragement, all kinds of emotions, but how many of us need restoration in our soul? But he restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Whose name's sake? His name's sake. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. But in the process, he's going to restore your soul. So the third point we want to look at this morning is that he is our guide. You know how many times we get people calling us for wisdom? Should I do this? Should I do that? What should, how should I respond to this? We get a lot of people calling us, reaching out for wisdom. We need guidance. Sometimes, we don't, sometimes we're out of fork in the road. Sometimes something's happening and we just don't know how to respond. We've been going through a situation that I uh, talked about earlier ourselves. And it's been going on for a while. And we've been trying to give it to the Lord, and we've been do, do, try, endeavoring to do that. But, and there, and there's a situation we, in our own flesh, we cannot change it. We cannot correct it. We cannot resolve the situation. But He can. He can. And there's a prayer that Jehoshaphat prayed in Second Chronicles chapter 20. Three big armies were coming against them. There were a time when you know, Israel was at a, a weak point in their, as far as the military was concerned. And Jehoshaphat prayed a prayer, and at the, end of, at the very end of verse 12 of Second Chronicles chapter 20, Jehoshaphat prayed, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. He is our guide. All the promises of God are yes and amen in him through us. And one of those promises is that he is our guide. So again, he does, he restores our soul. And he leads us in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. I want to go off on this for just a few moments. It says he is guiding us to the right path. He is guiding us to the path of righteousness, the right path where he wants us to go. And he's doing this for his name's sake. He's guiding us. He's leading us as our shepherd for his name's sake. Psalm 23, verse 23 says, The steps of a, of a good man, the steps of a righteous man, are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. How many of you know that God delights in your way? Or how many of you say, that's a prayer, you want God to delight in your way? The, the steps of a good man, of a righteous man, are ordered by the Lord. Okay? Psalm 25, verse 14 says, The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. And he will show them his covenant. That's awesome. If when you think about that. In other words, it says, honor and respect him. Honor and respect God. And he will show you his covenant. That's what the verse just said. And it says again, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. Those who honor him. Those who respect him. And he will show them his way. He will show them the, the direction to go. He will show them his covenant. God, we we uh, God, we wanted to go to Bible college. We honor and respect him. He showed us what to do. He showed me to go to the toy store. He showed us what to do. He showed us how to do it. Now, in, in, in where we are now, he's given us a budget. He's shown us how to save. He's shown us how to, to, to take the seed that he's given us and to multiply it for his glory and for his honor. When we fear him, when we honor him, when we respect him, he shows us his covenant. He will be your guide. I mean, isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? It works for us. Again, this is going back to Psalm 37, verse 4 and 5. It says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you desires of your heart. As you commit your way to him, trust in him. He will bring it to pass. And some of that brings it to pass. Some of that committing your way to him, trusting him, yeah, he will show you what to do. He will tell you what to do. He'll tell you what to give. He'll show you what to plant. He'll show you what to sell. He'll show you what to reap. He'll show you what to, what, how to do it. Number 6, chapter 6, verse 23 to 26. I want to read this. Um, I want, there's something I want to glean from here. Are we doing good? Okay. 
Moses is speaking, he says, speak to Aaron, God, God speaking to Moses, he says, speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, this is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. God tells Aaron, the priests, under Moses, how to bless the people. He says, bless the people, say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift you up and his countenance upon you and give you peace. We've already talked about both of those things. And so shall they, and so they shall put my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. I want to read this last part, verse 27 again. It says, And so they shall put whose name? God's name. They shall put my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. We were reading in Psalm 23, verse 3, that he says that he will guide us in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Okay? And it says here, they shall put my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. When you read the word name here, in verse 27 in the Hebrew, the word name here is the word shem. And this word shim, name, means reputation, fame, glory, or memorial, or monument. That's awesome. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a little bit of time with this. God says he's going to put his glory. He's going to put his name. He's going to put his reputation, his fame, his memorial on the, the people of Israel. God says, God says, my name is at stake. When you read the book of Acts, we are baptized into the name of Jesus. We are in Christ. God, see, when we're trusting God and his word, it's his word, it's his name, it's his reputation that is at stake, not yours. That makes sense? My, he says, God, my reputation is at stake. I'm making you a memorial. I'm making you a monument to show my glory. In other words, God wants to use your life and your as a testimony, as a memorial to the world to show his glory. That's awesome. When you think about it. He says, there's a verse in Isaiah 60, verse 7 says, All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together to you, and the rams of Nebaioth shall minister to you, and they shall ascend with acceptance on my altar, in this phrase, and I will glorify the house of my glory. God says, I will glorify the house of my glory. What's the house of God? The Hebrew, in the book of Hebrews, it says, We are the house of God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And God says, I will glorify my house, the house of my glory. You are me. We are the house of his glory. God says, I'm making you a memorial. I'm making you a monument of my glory. When they look at you, they see me. That's huge. When, when the world looks at us, they see him. Now, that can be good. That can also be negative. If we call ourselves Christians, and we preach the grace of God, we preach the nature of God, and then we treat people like junk, we disrespect them, we dishonor them, we shun them. We mistreat them. We are misrep misrepresenting God to them. That makes sense? And that's tragic. It, but God said, God wants to, God has put his name on us. And when some, for us, for most people, we are the first, uh, what's the word I want to, what I'm looking for? We are the first representation of God that some people ever see. Some people, we've, we've met people through the years, they are not so much mad at God, 
They're mad at his church because of his church has mistreated them. His church has misrepresented them. Does that make sense? Some, some, and I can take this a lot of different angles, but some people have taught that God's an angry God. That God's out to get you. They're preaching the opposite that all the promises of God are yes and amen. They're teaching that you have to do this, you have to perform this, you have to earn your salvation. That is not what the scripture says. Because scripture says that all the promises of God are yes and amen through, through, in him through us. The gospel says that we are not going to trust what we have to do. We're going to trust what he's already done. Is that making sense? And when people see us, they should see him. And when people see us and we're sick or we have lack or we're poor as a church mouse, so people like, I don't want what you got. But when people see us, and our lives are blessed, our, our lives are whole, our lives are, I'm not saying that we're perfect in every single way, but we are, we definitely have left. It's not that we have arrived, but we left. We're, we're going in the direction we need to go. Is that making sense? Hopefully I'm making sense this point. Um, but it says, when they look at us, they should see him. God wants to bless you. God wants to sanctify your life. God wants to clean up your life. God wants to provide for you. God wants to, to glorify his house. God wants to glorify his name in your life. Because you, his name in you and on you is his reputation. It's his memorial. It's his name. That makes sense? And God says when he puts his name on you, you are blessed. You are blessed. I hope that makes sense. This reminds me of what God told Abraham. He says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you great, and you shall be a blessing. God promised Abraham that he would be great and he would be a blessing. We studied last week that all the promises of God are yesterday, amen. The promise was made to Abraham and his seed, Christ. And we are Christ, and then we are heirs of the promise. So all I said in all of that, and everything I was saying last week, is to say that what God told Abraham is our promise too. God says he will bless you and make you great. Why? Because we are hot stuff? No. Because God has put his name on us to bless us for his glory. He will glorify the house of his glory for his name's sake. I'm hoping I'm making sense. I'm trying to connect a lot of dots here. But God wants to bless your life as a memorial, as a monument, so that when people see you and see your life, they say, I want Jesus. I want what you got. God is blessing you, not so that you can be, so, so people can boast in you. People, God is blessing you so that they can, they can say, well, I want Jesus. I want what you have. There's scriptures I can bring out and uh, when God says, when God says, you were once a desolate place, but now you are like the garden of Eden again. It is a testimony when you see a life that was on parole, or a life that was shipwrecked, now being beautified by his glory. That's awesome. If you knew where I came from, if you knew some things that happened in my life in the past, but you see what God has brought us and what God has done in, in our lives, you would give him glory. I'm hoping I'm making sense this morning. He goes on to say, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and you should... And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In chapter 15, he, he, gives, he comes to Abraham and says, After these things, a word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. God is our great reward. He, he's our shield. Whatever you're going through, whatever you may be going through, God is your shield 
that he is your great reward. God says, my name upon you is my blessing. Because his name on you is, is his honor. It's his reputation. It's his fame. It's his monument memorial. I want to bless you to be a monument to the world what I can do and how I can I want to show my salvation. I want to show my glory. I want to show my righteousness. I want to show my promises. As you, and you, as a memorial to the world, this is the God I serve. This is what God looks like. That making sense? Okay? God says, I want to help you to be a monument. I want to heal you to be a monument. I want to provide for you to be a monument. I want to honor you. For you to be a monument. Whatever you need, whatever you're going, the Lord is your shepherd, you shall not want. He will lead you to green pastures. He will restore your soul and lead you to the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Amen. He's doing all this cleanup, he's doing all this provision, he's giving you all these promises, and they're yes and amen for his glory, for his honor, for his name's sake. His name is not the Lord. His reputation is on the line, not yours. People are attracted to me through you. That should be the testimony. God said, and Jesus told the disciples, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. Our lives are to be a witness, a monument, a memorial that this is what God does. This is what salvation looks like. That makes sense? Not what we do in the flesh, but when he glorifies the house of his glory in your life and through my life. Hopefully I'm making sense. People see, when people see you, they want to receive Jesus. That should be the testimony. That should be the end result. It's not that when people see you, they want to be like you because they like you. When people see you, they want to be like you because they want to be like Jesus. That make sense? Our life should be a memorial to Jesus, not should be a memorial to us. That makes sense? Yeah. Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15 says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And we're going to talk about more about in Christ next week. And through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, we are the aroma of death, leading to death, and to the other, the aroma of life, leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many peddling the word of God, but for the sincerity, but as from God. We speak in the sight of God and in Christ. There's a lot here I'm not going to go into, but uh, God says that He leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us He diffuses the fragrance of His knowledge in every place. God releases His fragrance. God releases his knowledge in every place through us. That's awesome. God has, God has set us free. God has cleaned us up. God has redeemed us. God has sanctified us so that we can be a fragrance of his knowledge in every place that we go. Every place we go, every place we stand our foot, everything that we touch, everything that we speak, we should be speaking the fragrance of God as a memorial for his name's sake. He leads us in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. God says, I'm making you a monument. I'm making you a memorial. I'm making you a testimony. I'm making you an advertisement of my glory. Mark 16 says this, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up service and they can drink anything deadly. It will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. We will do this in his name. He leads us in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. He's making us a monument. And anything we do, anything we speak in the name of Jesus, it will bow to his fame. It will bow to his name. Amen. God has put his name on us and we are being a blessing wherever we go. Acts 8.12, we can see this throughout the book of Acts, but they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. 
of men and women were baptized. They preached in the name of Jesus. They blessed them in the name of Jesus. It says in Revelation that we are been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb as kingdom priests. And God, just as God instructed Aaron to bless the people in his name, God has instructed us to bless people and preach the name of Jesus to people. All the promises of God are yes, and in him, amen, in him, and for the glory of God through us. And he restores my soul. He redeems me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. When God puts his name, he puts his glory. That's huge. Where God puts his name, he puts his glory. You are the house of his glory. And where he, God puts his name, he puts his glory. When the name of Jesus was preached, people got saved. When the name of Jesus was preached, people got healed. When the name of Jesus was preached, people were filled with the Holy Spirit. You are the house of his glory. And I will put my name on you, he says. I will mark you with my glory. I will, you will be my memorial or my monument to the world. I just read this, I just quoted this, that he has redeemed us as kings and priests, that we shall reign on the earth. We shall proclaim his peace. We shall proclaim his salvation. We shall proclaim that our God reigns. Amen? God says, when you go in my name, you will cast out devils. When you go in my name, you will heal the sick. When you go, my house is where I put my name. We are his house, and God has put his name on us. And you are the house of his glory. I want you to go as the body of Christ in my. We are the body of who? Christ. We are the body of who? Christ. So we are the body of his name. We are the body of who he is. And we are to go as a unit. I can expand on this. Uh, I've talked about this many times before. But Jesus said in John 13, the night before uh, he's arrested and goes to the cross, he spent time with the disciples, he washes their feet. And he says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. I want to spend just a little bit of time with this for a moment. I taught it before, but let me give a short version of this. God says, or Jesus is saying, we shall do greater works than he did does because we believe in him. That's a whole message with himself. And some of us would be just satisfied with doing what the works that Jesus did, let alone the greater works. But he says, you will not only do the works that I've done and greater works, and what's the condition? Why do, why do we do greater works? Yes, we believe in him, that's, that's the criteria. But also, he says, you will do greater works than these because I go to the Father. Isaiah 55 says that his word will not return void. Jesus is is the word of God. And Jesus is, is about ready to return to the Father. And the, Jesus, the word, is not going to return to the water, to the Father, unless he fulfills what he is called to do. Jesus came to die. We're getting ready to get into the Christmas season here pretty soon. And we're going to celebrate Jesus' birth. But Jesus was born to die. Jesus came to go to the cross to redeem us to God, to reconcile us back to God. Jesus is going to the Father because of the finished work of the cross. It hasn't happened yet, according to John 13. But he's speaking towards the cross. He says, I'm going to go to the Father because I finished the work. And because I finished the work, you will do the works I do, and greater works you will do if you believe on me. And then he goes on to say, in the very next verse, he goes, and. I love that word and, because that word and is a conjunction. He says, not only will do you, you do greater works, because I go to the Father, because I finished the work. And not only, see, 
No other age since the cross has experienced two things. Before Jesus said these things, before Jesus went to the cross, no other age has ever experienced the finished work of the cross. Also, no other age has ever experienced the, ba the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In context, Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. He just washed his disciples' feet, and he's also talking about another helper will come. Since the cross, we have the finished work of the cross, and we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to go into all that right now. But Jesus is going to the Father. Because he just said, greater work should you do because I go to the Father. He's going to the Father because the work is done. And he's going to the Father to release the Holy Spirit. And because he goes to the Father, because the work is done, and because he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, whatever you ask in my name, Jesus says, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. I've done a study on this before, and I don't have the time to teach it all right now, but that word ask, when you, if you study it out, it means to demand what is due. It means to demand what is due. And when I, when I taught that before, it, it sounds arrogant. How, who are we to demand God anything? We talked last week that the promise was made to Christ and his, to Abraham and his seed, meaning Christ. We talked last week about how if we are Christ, we are of Abraham's seed. So the promise is made unto us. And so, I just say, we are the... And I, excuse me, let me uh, lose my train of thought here. In Hebrews chapter 9, it talks about the testator. When someone makes a covenant or gives a will, that will has no effect. That inheritance has no effect until the testator dies. Jesus is going to the Father because he's going to die. And because he goes to the Father, and because he's going to die, the testament, the new covenant, is going to be in full effect. And God is not, God, see, all the promises of God are yes and amen in him through us. But God, God is glorified when we demand what is due. See, I, I, I'm getting two thoughts. I'm getting ahead of myself. I think I'm being confusing. But when, when, a, when a testament is given, that testament cannot be put into effect until the testator dies. If someone had a will in my name until that testator died. I could not take hold of that will or the, the inheritance of that will. When that person died, it would be the proper procedure to the Lord, through the lawyers and court system. I would have to provide a death certificate for that testator. Everything would have to be verified and go through the system. And then, through the, through the proper channels, I can receive the inheritance. Hopefully I'm making sense. And so, as an heir of a promise, through the proper channels of a testator dying, I can demand what is due. God has given us an inheritance in Christ. And Jesus is our testator. And all the promises have been made to us in God, in Christ. And all, that's why when Jesus came, all the promises of God are yes and amen in him through us. Because Jesus, our testator, died. And now all the promises of God are now in full effect. The covenant is in full effect. And the inheritance is in full effect to us, the heir of the seed. We can receive the full effect of the promise because Jesus, our testator, died. And when we ask in his name, in the name of the testator, he, we, he says, and whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. The promise has already been made. The promise has already been decreed. The testator has died. Jesus is our death.
death certificate. And now we can demand, we, what is due, we can ask in his name that the Father might be glorified in the Son. If we don't ask and we don't receive, Jesus, in a sense, died for nothing. He'd given us his inheritance. He's made a promise. He, he died so that we can inherit the promise. But if we don't ask and receive, then he went through all of that just so we can continue to live a miserable life and never receive what he promised and what he died to give us. That, in a sense, is mocking the cross. Jesus died so the promises might be yes and amen through us. And God is glorified. When we ask in his name. And in case we didn't hear him right, he repeats himself. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, I don't know about you, but there's two words in here I really like. It says, and whatever you ask, it says, if you ask anything, what's whatever? And what is anything? I don't know about you, but that's a blank check to me. When someone says you can ask anything you want. You know, when you go out to eat with somebody and they say, you can, it's on me today, you can have anything you want. Of course, it has to be on the menu, right? But uh, and the reason I say that is because we can ask anything in his name according to his will. He's already provided provision. He's already provided healing. He's already provided all these things. All of these are things according to his will. We already read last week from, in Romans chapter 8, if he gave us his son, how much more will he not give us all things? Do you need healing? Do you need provision? Do you need a miracle? Do you need deliverance? Do you need wisdom? Do you need provision? Do you need guidance? Ask! And it's yours. Ask. Believing. And it's yours. And he will be glorified. Ask. So that he can glorify the house of his glory. By answering the request. God is magnified. God is glorified when we ask and receive. God is glorified when we're healed. God is glorified when we are blessed to be a blessing. God is glorified when his church is reconciled. God is glorified when whatever is broken is healed. Ask, and in his name brings him glory. That makes sense? <coughs> so one of the ways that God brings glory to his house is by you asking and you receiving. So he brings glory to his house. That makes sense? He says, these signs will follow those who believe. He, notice that he's not talking to apostles and prophets. At the time, they weren't apostles. They weren't apostles yet. I'm not going to go on all the technology of that, but he says, he, and he's not just talking to apostles, he's not just talking to prophets, he's talking to unlearned men who are just following Jesus. Okay? And these signs will follow those who believe. I hope I'm making sense on all of this. But he restores my soul. He leads me past the righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley, verse 4, walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they come to me. The fourth thing I want to look at this morning, and like I spent a lot of time on this one, is he is our protection. God will protect you. We just read, he says, I, you know, though we walk through the valley of shadow of death, we will fear no evil. Because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God, there's 365 times God says, do not fear. We don't have to fear. Fear is the opposite of faith. And we need to feed our faith and not feed our fear. We need to trust God. God is our protection. It goes on to say, verse 5, You prepare a table before you, me, in the absence of my enemies. No, in the presence of my enemies. 
I wish it said differently. How many of us have enemies? How many people have things, people who are against us? We, Sherry and I have had more enemies in the last couple of years than we've ever had. And I've got to go and all of that. But he says he prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. And he says, my head, he anoints my head with oil and my cup runs over. His anointing, his provision, his blessing, his approval, his acceptance is running over our head. And it's overflowing. He is our promoter. That's the next thing I want to He is our promoter. People might, Satan using people may try to demote you. Might try to snuff you out. But God is your promoter. He is your peace. He is your guide. He is your protection. Is that making sense? Verse 6. It says, Surely goodness and mercy. Surely goodness and mercy. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me some of the days. Eventually, no, all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God says, mercy and goodness will follow you all of your days. No matter what you've done, no matter what you haven't done, God, his mercy and his goodness will follow you all of your days. He is your hope. Even against all hope, even if hope is deferred, he is your hope. Jeremiah 17, I don't know, uh, wish I more time to more time with this, but it says, Blessed is the man that trusted in the Lord, and whose Hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters that spread it out her roots by the river and shall not see when the heat comes. But her leaves shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. There's a lot I could expound on this. It talked about in verses 5 and 6 of the same chapter. Curses the man who trusts in a man, man full of strength. But he will be like a shrub in the wilderness. And he won't see the good when it comes. When I've talked this before, I'll talk, I'll, I'll, I'll read from the King James and it talks about how the, how the cursed man is, doesn't see the good when it comes. And the blessed man doesn't see the heat when it comes. Why? Because it's, it's what they're focused on. I'm going to talk about this a little bit next week about what we're focused on. But it says the blessed man, he shall not see when the heat comes. The drought is there, the heat is there, the famine is there, but he doesn't see it. Why? Because his hope is in the Lord. His hope is not in the drought. His hope is not in destruction. His hope is not in failure. His hope is in the Lord. And that's what his focus on. It says that her leaves shall be green and shall not be careful in your drought. His leaves will always be green. Why? Because his roots are always planted in the Lord. God is our hope. And no matter what, you know, someone reached out to us a few, a few months ago and they said, you know, they were, they were going through a tough time. And they, they quoted the verse that says, well, hope deferred makes our heart sick. Yes, it does. How many of us have hope has been deferred and made our heart sick? And that is, that is true. And the scripture does teach you. At the same point in time, there is nothing good about a sick heart. There is nothing edifying about a sick heart. It might be a true fact, but we just read about how he is to restore our soul. He's not here to, to, to justify us having a sick heart. God, some of us have had a sick heart because hope has been, been some of us hope has been deferred too long. And it, Jesus is our hope. And the scripture says uh, even th that even in a year of drought, even in a year of lack and famine, her leaves were always green. Why? Because Jesus is our hope. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in one. 
He lies me beside the still waters. He restores my soul and leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. He goes on to say that truly goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I ain't got to talk next week about dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. We need to dwell in his presence. We need to dwell in him so that we can stretch out our roots by the stream. That makes some sense? You know, we're talking about the promises of God. We're talking about hope. And a lot of us know the promises of God and we have a hope for them. But if we disconnect from dwelling in his presence, then whatever voice we're, at, we're listening to is going to speak to that lack of hope, that hope being deferred. When we get our eyes off Jesus, our eyes on the storm, our heart becomes sick, being hope deferred. But when we put our eyes off the storm and put our heights on Jesus, faith is revived. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. That makes sense. You know, and so we need to be in his presence. We need to stretch out our roots by the stream so that hope can continue to be revived. It's just like earlier, there's something we've been going through. And I just said, you know what? Enough is enough. I want what God, the enemy has stolen how I want it back. That makes sense? First Peter says this, Blessed be the Lord and God, the God of our Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance, as an inheritance again, incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation and ready to be revealed in the last time. This passage of scripture speaks to almost everything I've been speaking about this morning as I can, as I can bring this message to a close. He is our living hope. And by his mercy that follows us all the days of our life, he has begotten us to get to a, a living hope. That through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior, that we may have an inheritance. We may have a promise that is not corruptible, is not defiled, is reserved for us. And we are kept by the power of God through faith. Our faith in the cross, our faith in our salvation, ready to be revealed as a monument, as a memorial, as the glory of his house for his glory. That makes sense? And so, hopefully that makes sense this morning. It's a very simple message. But God is our provider. He's our peace. He's our guide. He's our protection. He's our brother. He's our hope. He's our shepherd. And we shall not be in ruins. The promise of God. Hope we're making sense this morning. Lord, I just thank you for your word. I glorify your name. I magnify you. I thank you for the promise of God that are yes and amen to the glory of God through us. We worship you.